After the roller coaster of a season that was season 4, the writers had luckily already had an idea for what season 5 was to be, with many hints and foreshadowings inserted in earlier episodes. There's everything you could ask for. A dramatic character entrance. A dramatic character exit. A dramatic character death? We have all this to cover and more, as this season tries many things that Buffy hadn't before. Most of which work, some of which don't. But this is by no means a mixed bag, but quality television. This is an episodic analysis of season 5 of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Well, this is the first time that a season opener for Buffy wasn't written by Joss Whedon, and it is painfully obvious as this episode ultimately tries nothing new. Buffy is craving a bit more action in her life, going out after dark and actively hunting vampires rather than just patrolling. Giles, meanwhile, confides in Willow that he's considering leaving Sunnydale as he believes Buffy has learned all she needs to know from him, and he's just wasting away considering he doesn't have a job, which probably explains why he was performing at that cafe last season. As the episode would imply, Dracula shows up and begins causing havoc, making Xander one of his bug-eating worshippers with his mystical magic. Again. Xander is the butt of the joke. Again. Dracula manages to get into Buffy's house and he bites her while she's under his thrall. This enrages Riley, especially since Buffy tries to hide it from the gang and they plan their attack on his newly appeared mansion. Riley and Giles end up getting lost in Dracula's mansion while Buffy manages to overcome Dracula's magics to stake him, but not before drinking some of his blood. Dracula's dead, by the way, and he attempts to reform multiple times but gives up until Buffy leaves. Buffy later talks to Giles and tells him she wishes to learn more about her Slayer heritage after doing the spell at the end of the last season, which, if you remember, allowed the spirit of the first Slayer into her dreams. Giles decides that he's going to stick around after Buffy tells him she still has more to learn and Buffy then returns home where her sister Dawn is raking around in her room. Buffy, if you're going out, why don't you take your sister? Mom! Yep, I also thought I'd skipped an episode when I first saw the ending, but Buffy's no longer an only child. I remember last season when I said the Jonathan episode was like a prototype for an arc we'd get later on. Well, here it is. First though, let's talk about the episode and how, well... Underwhelming, it is. Giles is still hung up about the doubt Spike put into his head during his meddling in the Yoko factor. While Willow attempts to convince him to stay, it's really only Buffy that can do that, and finally, Giles has a purpose after being completely lost as a character for an entire season. Dracula's here, the most notorious vampire of all time, and in true Buffy fashion, he's dealt with in one episode and never comes back. I like the way they play him off as not important, because they really want you to think he'll be the main villain for the season. In fact, these first few episodes are all about setting up fake villains to just be dealt with then and there. Buffy feels attracted to Dracula even without his magic, and this causes Riley to feel insecure about the relationship. Buffy was in love with the vampire before, and her crush on Dracula does indeed show a pattern to Riley that he doesn't like. Dracula wishes to teach Buffy about how her powers are rooted in darkness, which Buffy is timid about until she drinks from Dracula, revealing the primal instinct of the first slayer still within her after restless. This explains her hunting at the start of the episode. Dracula goes on and on about setting Buffy's path, and that because her power is rooted in darkness, she can go dark and turn evil and just embrace it, similar to what Faith did. However, she conquers that, and Dracula therefore leaves. This episode's meaning and subjects are very deep, but it's disguised with a comedic storyline which I'm not always a fan of if you remember enemies from season 3. Xander is humiliated by the monster of the week yet again, and comes to the exact same conclusion we thought he'd already come to several times before like in the Zeppo and Primeval. But where Spike, you might be asking? He makes one appearance in the episode when Riley goes to interrogate him for information on Dracula and the two seem to have developed a rivalry of some sort. Riley probably feels that since he's a vampire, Buffy might fall for him. Like that's ever gonna happen. Buffy and Dracula drinking from each other spins Riley and he's going to try and discover what she experienced through his own discoveries throughout the season. Not a great episode, but not terrible. Harmony's back again with her own team of minions, massacring the owners of the local magic shop in order to get Buffy's attention so they can kill her. Giles becomes interested in purchasing the magic shop after the owner's death as a new hobby slash place to work. Dawn continues to annoy the gang, accidentally inviting Harmony into Buffy's house while she's being babysat by Xander and Anya. Buffy isn't happy about this but puts it aside when Dawn is kidnapped by Harmony and her minions in order to save her. Harmony obviously loses and flees while Buffy does just that, kills her minions and rescues Dawn. In the final scene, Giles has purchased the magic box shop and is currently stocking it while Dawn writes in her journal that everybody is soon going to be in for a surprise. Unlike the resilient, intelligent and experienced characters in the gang, Dawn is just a 14 year old girl with absolutely nothing remarkable about her at all. All the characters act like she's always been there and are oblivious to the fact that she just appeared last episode. Even the show acts like nothing's wrong and she's added to the opening credits starting from here. The only one who seems to know that something's up is this random crazy guy who tells her that she doesn't belong. Well thank god somebody said it, I thought I was having a brain aneurysm or something. At least if you know that they're not insane, something is going on. The decision to add Dawn with no explanation was a risky one, but it 
it works for the story, just give it time. Buffy and Don are both identical with their thoughts, you know, both wish they could be like the other. Buffy just wants to be a normal girl living a normal life, while Don wants to be more involved with the gang and help with research and taking out, you know, the monsters. But Buffy forbids it as she at least wants Don to have a normal life which Buffy can't have. An interesting contrast of character there. The ending implies that Don has something sinister planned, maybe she's the villain for the season. Or she isn't. She's just talking about showing off that she can be a valuable member of the gang, nothing more. Tara expresses feelings, similar to Don's, that she doesn't feel fully accepted by the rest of the gang. Even though Willow insists she is, and that none of the gang dislike her, which is true, it doesn't mean much to Tara. Riley just kind of stands around for the episode, not really doing anything that contributes to the story. It's almost like he seems irrelevant to Buffy. She doesn't include him in any of her fights or battles. Harmony is another fake-out villain, similar to Dracula, to make you think they're the main villain of the season, only to be defeated in one episode. That being said, we haven't seen the last of Harmony, and she will continue to be an active part in the season sporadically. Spick's entrance into the episode and deconstruction of Harmony's plan does assure the viewer that Harmony isn't going to be the next main villain, in case any of you were worried they were going to pull another fast one on you. Buffy still treats Spike like a threat, despite his chip. However, Spike doesn't exactly hate the sight of Buffy like he once did. Hmm. It's this season's Xander episode, and written by Gene Espenson nonetheless. I was incredibly disappointed that Xander never got his own episode last season, but this one makes up for it, despite being mostly irrelevant to the season's plotline. The demon Toth arrives in Sunnydale with a mystical rod that will split Buffy into two separate people, one which houses all her Slayer aspects, and another which is entirely 19 year old girl. The theory is that Toth was going to split the two so he could kill the non-Slayer Buffy, which would kill both halves, although he ends up hitting Xander with it instead. We see the story from the perspective of the negative Xander, whose anxieties and insecurities portray the positive Xander as an imposter rather than the other half of him. The positive Xander, meanwhile, manages to not only charm his way into a permanent position at the construction site, but an entire apartment despite having a piece of shit credit score. The gang manage to finally work out that it isn't an imposter Xander but two versions of the same Xander, and Buffy stops them from killing each other just in time. They slap the two back together, and as the gang helps Xander move out of his parents' basement, Riley reveals to him that he knows Buffy doesn't love him. Riley does his absolute best to support Buffy and be the best partner he can be, even reassuring her that he wouldn't prefer just the theoretical non-slayer Buffy and that the Slayer is a part of who she is and he knows that. He still can't convince her he's worth loving. Which we got an idea about last season when he confessed to her that he loved her and she decided to segue into force murder. Ah, yes, happy days. Anyway, a Jane Espenson Xander episode was always a recipe for success. Her writing still just suits his character brilliantly. One thing I noticed is how she manages to find a common ground with Giles' character. Most of the time, Giles is either portrayed as incredibly intelligent or a bumbling fool, depending on what suits the episode's plot better, but she manages to combine them both. Spike seems to be obsessed with Buffy now, as we see him scrounging for scrap of the rubbish dump earlier in the episode for things to create a Buffy-like mannequin, which he kicks over, leading the audience to believe he's got an idea up his sleeve to finally kill her. The truth finally begins to hit Anya about being human. She dislocated her shoulder last episode, it's because of this that she fears being mortal again since she's lived for over a thousand years. Positive Xander helps her figure out that he'll be there with her through it all, since they love each other. Very romantic. Going back just a minute to the whole double Xander thing, I remember an issue last season though where old plots for episodes were recycled into slightly different plots with the same general idea, and we do the same here. Doppelgangland is an obvious comparison to make where Willow was the one with an evil twin. Okay, technically, because of the evil twin thing, the plots aren't identical, but like I said, the same general ideas. This episode ages better than Doppelgangland due to the use of Nicholas Brennan's real-life identical brother as the other Xander, rather than computer effects of the time left to convey the idea. That being said, I believe Doppelgangland is a better episode. Rebecca Rand Kirshner joins the writing team this season and she'll continue to write for the show until its conclusion. Her first episode centers around Joyce being hospitalised due to taking a funny turn in the house and collapsing, asking Don who she is. Hmm. They chat with a medical intern named Ben who tells them that Joyce will be fine, although they still don't know exactly what caused her collapse. Rayleigh's heart, however, is beating incredibly fast, like inhumanly. He shrugs off Buffy's concerns despite the fact he could literally drop dead from a heart attack at any minute. It's an after effect of the Moderna vaccine, I mean, the, the drugs that Maggie Walsh was pumping into him last season. Buffy calls Graham, who lived through the initiative's collapse laps if you remember, who arrived in Sunnydale to help Riley get over it, but he refuses. Meanwhile Spike and Harmony get back together and Spike pays a visit to the doctor that the military have brought along to help Riley in order to get his chip removed. The doctor tricks Spike into thinking he's removed the chip as Buffy manages to convince Riley to get help and Spike and Harmony flee when they arrive. Graham chats with Riley after he's fixed up and he tells Riley that he's nothing without the initiative. Riley tells him he's wrong because he has Buffy, but Graham responds by saying it'll never be enough to convince him to stay forever. In the final scene, Spike has a dream about Buffy arriving in his crypt where the two begin to make out and Spike declares his love for Buffy, jolting him 
him a week in horror. Yep, Spike is in love with Buffy. You thought the reason for him hanging around was to be a villain? Well, here's one hell of a twist. They show earlier in the episode that while he attempted to be threatening towards Buffy during the cold open, he still saved her from a vampire when she was in danger. If Spike truly hated Buffy, he would have let her die, but alas, here we are. This realisation of love fuels his character for the rest of the show. Finally, Spike has a reason to stick around it like last season. You could argue that he was stuck around last season because he had feelings for Buffy, but considering how long it took the writers to reveal this, I still don't think that makes his presence for almost all of last season fully justified. Riley and Buffy are also a main focus for the episode, as Riley confesses to Buffy that he believes she'll leave him if he doesn't have some form of supernatural abilities, like Angel or Dracula, but this probably stems from the fact that he knows she doesn't love him. Graham also reminds him that the military was where he was always meant to be, it's what he always wanted to do with his life before Buffy, sending even more doubts into Riley's head about staying in Sunnydale. Also, Graham's back. Yay? I will talk more about my thoughts on him in a few episodes. This is yet another fake out episode where we get a real villain for the season next episode. Although you could argue that we already saw them in this episode. The episode opens with a group of monks running for their lives several months earlier. They perform a ritual of some sort. Buffy in the present finds a weird orb while chatting to a nightman on patrol. She takes it to the gang who begin researching. Buffy then heads to the hospital to fill up her mother's prescription where she runs into both Ben and the nightman, who now appears insane and rabid. One of the monks we saw in the flashback has made his way to Sunnydale, getting captured by what he calls the Beast, not to be confused with the character the Beast from Angel's fourth season. Oh god no, we're not there yet. This is Gloria, a seemingly harmless blonde girl who tortures the monk, looking for a key of some sort which she seems desperate to obtain. She sucks the sanity out of a security guard which she seems to feed off of. Buffy is convinced that whatever's harming her mother is mystical and performs a spell that will reveal any spells to her eyes by making them transparent. Of course, Dawn is transparent and Buffy freaks out telling her that she's not her sister. Dawn is incredibly confused about her freak out and Buffy storms out. As she's on her way to the warehouse where she found the orb, Giles tells her that it's possible it was to protect from some form of primordial evil. What are you doing here? Five oh. words or less. Out for a walk. Bitch. Buffy runs into Glory, who beats the shit out of her, and Buffy flees with the monk, rescuing him by jumping at a window. Ah, oh, wait a minute, that's Angel's thing. Anyway, Glory throws a tantrum and collapses the building on herself, knocking her out, I guess. As the monk dies, most likely due to injuries sustained from jumping out of a window, he informs Buffy that the monks had to hide the key from Glory, so they sent it to her so that she could protect it in the form of a sister. Dawn is the key that Gloria is searching for. All of the characters' memories of Dawn are false and were created by the monks during the events of the first episode of the season. Dawn has no idea she's the key and believes herself to be completely normal. The monk dies and the episode ends with Buffy and Dawn making up as Buffy apologises for shoving her earlier and they both worry about the state of their mother. Joyce's condition seems to be getting worse, mind you. She almost collapses again until she has a prescription. Anyway, on a completely different matter, our season's villain has been introduced before the second half of the season, a huge change of pace to last season's crawl of a plotline. Glory isn't dead after being crushed by the building, as you can probably tell from how strong she was in her fight against Buffy. And what is she? Why does she want the key? What does it do? We don't know yet, but I'm just glad they're bringing this in now, as not 10 episodes from now. Dawn is yet another case of the show setting up a fake season's villain before revealing her not to be. She's the key. Once a mystical ball of energy, and now a teenage girl. It is Buffy's duty to protect her, and that's all Buffy knows, and that's all she needs to know right now. Giles officially opens the magic box under his management and appoints Anya to help out due to her newfound fascination with capitalism. That probably stems from her love of the board game Game of Life, which she first played a few episodes ago. Business is booming though, so that's good for them. One of my absolute favourite visual gags in the whole show is when Buffy enters the magic box for the first time and Giles stands there in this ridiculous outfit with his dumbass look on his face. No words are spoken throughout the interaction, yet Giles can instantly tell he looks ridiculous and takes the outfit off. Absolutely brilliant. This episode is great, with many memorable moments just like that, including the conclusion to the opening arc of the season. Oh look, Joss Whedon is alive for this season, opting out of the season's opener to write perhaps the only Tara-centric episode of the show. Her family is in town right around the time of her 20th birthday and they attempt to take Tara home with them due to an old family legend that all the women in their family are of demon heritage and become evil in their early 20s. This explains why Tara didn't help Willow do that spell all the way back in Goodbye Iowa, if you remember that from absolutely ages ago. She didn't want it to be revealed that she was a demon on their demon locator spell. To avoid the gang seeing her in her demon state, Tara does a spell that prevents the gang from seeing demons. Like, at all. They're just invisible. This is a truly dreadful idea which is showcased when Glory employs some demons to kill Buffy and her friends and they can't see them. Even though I'd be absolutely furious if this happened to me, the gang aren't betrayed when they find out Tara did this, at least not for long, as her family tells them the truth. Willow tries to argue that this can't be true and Spike strolls in settling the whole thing by whacking Tara in the face which sets his chip off, which exposes that it's all made up to make the women in Tara's family fall in line. Tara's birthday party occurs as she and Willow share a very magical moment on the dance floor. There's more meat to this episode that I didn't go 
go over. Buffy immediately informs Giles of the truth about Dawn, but chooses not to tell the other members of the gang as they would probably all act differently around her, alerting her that something's up. Buffy doesn't want Dawn to know that she isn't real, as that would probably cause some form of existential crisis within a 14 year old, aside from the one that a 14 year old's already having. You can already tell that this isn't going to end as Buffy intends. They also establish that Buffy's father, who we haven't seen since, god, when she was bad? Has it really been that long? Well, he's off living in Spain now with his secretary. Okay, I mean, he seemed like he wanted to be involved with Buffy's life earlier in the show. Buffy even mentions visiting him and I will remember you. Maybe Dunn's arrival also changed how events played out rather than just memories, causing him to change personality. It doesn't really matter, but it's something to think about. Anyway, Buffy also moves off campus and back home due to the stress of having to look after her mother, although she still does intend on studying. Riley and Buffy also have a falling out as she won't tell them the real reason why she's suddenly being so overprotective of Dawn, storming out of the episode not even halfway through. He goes drinking at Willie's bar where Willie isn't and turns down a vampire who attempts to lure him outside. Fun fact, the girl that plays the vampire was actually sired on screen back in Doppelgangland nearly two seasons ago. Him and Buffy make up at the end of the episode but he doesn't take back what he said. He's right. In a way, yeah, he wants to be there for Buffy and he's supportive, but she isn't letting him in at all. It causes him to feel irrelevant, which he pretty much has been for the entire season thus far. This episode gives Tara some much needed character growth. She now feels fully accepted by the gang following this and works alongside them, similar to both Willow and Xander's parents, who both only make one appearance in the entire show, so does Tara's. And that's future Hollywood actress Amy Adams as Tara's cousin in one of her earliest roles. She only gets about three scenes and one of these doesn't even have her speak any dialogue at all, so it was an easy paycheck that week for her. Willow and Tara are now stronger than ever as a couple and would seem comfortable expressing the love around their friends. Alright, forewarning, I'm now going to moan about the chip and Spike's heading in. Spike being the solution to the problem is a great idea, but I thought the chip was supposed to go off when he intended to do harm to someone, not after he'd committed the act. Seriously, it depends on the writer because it explains why he couldn't point the gun at Xander and the Yoko factor, or couldn't bite Willow back when he was first introduced in the season and, um, what was it, the initiative? But he straight up had the thought of punching Tara, approached her, reeled back, and then struck her before the damn thing decided to kick in for convenience's sake. Why is this so hard to keep straight? I don't understand. Anyway, speaking of Spike... Buffy lets her guard down whilst fighting your standard vampire on patrol one night and decides she doesn't want to make the same mistakes as previous slayers which led to their deaths. She unsuccessfully researches with Giles but they come up with nothing from the Watcher's journals. She turns to Spike, who did kill two slayers after all, and he details the experiences of when he was William, being turned by Drusilla in 1880, following being ridiculed for his poetry and his love for a girl named Cecily who doesn't love him back. Much like with Buffy, although Cecily didn't love William because she's actually a thousand year old vengeance demon, <laughs> but we're getting way ahead of ourselves there. Spike grew an obsession for killing the slayer as he adjusted into the group with Angelus and Darla, leading him to kill one 20 years later during the Boxer Rebellion. We see him kill a second in New York in 1977, taking her leather jacket, which is the one he's still wearing in the show by the way, as he talks to Buffy about all stairs having a death wish, to which she sees him as the pre-chip Spike talking to her. Through his tales of death and destruction, she remembers why so many people were scared of this now harmless vampire. Spike then attempts to come on to Buffy after detailing how he brutally snuffed two slayers, which clearly doesn't work, and Buffy denies him. You're beneath me. Spike plans to kill Buffy following this humiliation as Harmony pleads for him to reconsider this awful idea. We then get one final flashback of Spike and Drew after they left Sunnydale at the conclusion of Season 2, revealing that Drew left Spike because of his obsession with Buffy and because she most likely foresaw his love for her in one of those many visions she gets. Buffy returns home, meanwhile in the present, and Joyce reveals that she has to go back to the hospital for more tests after they found some concerning results during her previous stay. Spike approaches a crying Buffy, deciding instead to console her. Spike is so conflicting here! Buffy views him as evil in his past, yet cries on his shoulder at the end of the episode. It's like she sees him as a completely different character now. Spike also expresses that he has feelings for Buffy doing their chat at the bronze, although doesn't confess his love quite yet. Buffy obviously turns him down because she has Riley, although it's not like she lists that as a reason, instead choosing to point out that she's a human being and he's an undead vampire. The flashbacks in this episode are connected with the corresponding Angel episode Darla, which explores a lot more of the already established Angel-Darla dynamic. But this episode establishes Spike's past, and what he was like prior to his siring, and how he adjusted, which is something we haven't even had a glimpse of prior to this. And we haven't seen the last of this, as there's a crucial part of William's life that we haven't seen yet, which will be introduced in a few seasons' time. Spike reveals that the reason why he managed to kill those two slayers when no one else could was because every slayer, deep within themselves, has a death wish. They want to be set free from this hell of preventing apocalypses and killing demons so that when, for that split second, they slip up and that desire for death takes over, he takes advantage and grants their wish. Of course, this is all foreshadowing. What are you, stupid? Also, that shot of Spike at Buffy's knees is incredibly symbolic of their situation. The only other thing that happens in this episode is that the guy 
gang. Cole agreed to take out a vampire nest the next night once they've regrouped with more weapons, but Riley just runs in on his own later with a grenade and does the job. Riley's entirely capable with all his military training to do the job on his own, but drags the gang along with him because Buffy asks him to. Harmony reappears in this episode, who will now disappear and not return for another seven episodes with no justifiable explanation as to where she's been, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Very good episode, and sets up a lot of things that will become key in upcoming storylines. It's always nice when things are actually set up with a purpose as opposed to last season. Spig gets up to his usual shit stirring when Riley catches him snooping around smelling Buffy's clothes while she's at the hospital with Joyce and Don. He tells Riley about Joyce being at the hospital, which Buffy hasn't even been informed about herself, and that Riley can't keep Buffy satisfied because he doesn't have any vampire in him like Angel or Dracula. Joyce meanwhile gets the results of her CAT scan back and they've found a shadow in her brain, which is a brain tumour. Christ! This destroys Buffy as it reminds her of mortality, including her own, which is one of the main themes of the season. At the magic box, Tara theorises that Glory may be so old that the reason the gang can't find anything on her with the research is because she predates the written word. At that moment, Glory actually pays the gang a visit, but not to attack them, to buy ingredients needed for a mystical snake summoning spell which will lead her to the key, and since the gang have never actually seen Glory, their suspicions are never raised. It's not until Anya looks at the receipts later that they click on who it was. Riley and Don spend some time together as Buffy informs Riley not to tell Don about how serious Joyce's condition was just yet, and Don tells Riley that he's been good for Buffy after how worked up she always got over Angel. This doesn't improve Riley's thought process as he interprets this information as Buffy not being as invested with their relationship as she was with Angel's, which, let's be honest, is true with how the show is portraying these two. Buffy gets told about Glory's little shopping trip as Glory raises a snake demon to find the key. It takes off for the magic box and sets its sights on Don to turning back to inform Glory. Buffy manages to stop it before it can get back to her, killing it. Riley is back at Willie's bar where he actually allows that vampire to bite him briefly this time before staking it in order to get the same experience as Buffy did when she was bit by Dracula. Joyce tells Dawn about her brain tumour, which they still don't know if it's operable or not, and Buffy once again turns down Riley's attempts to console her despite the fact she was already to do so with Spike last episode. She can't be vulnerable around him. Who knows why? But Riley is understandably annoyed that he can't assist Buffy with the emotional baggage that this type of situation can induce. It's through Spike comments, Don's reveal, and another conversation with Xander where he confronts Riley about taking out the vampire nest last episode on his own that leads Riley to start his addiction to being fed from by vampires, which will continue over the next few episodes. Xander catches on to Buffy and Riley's relationship problems after his chat with Riley in the magic box, and it's important that I point this out for an unfortunately closely approaching episode. Riley and Buffy really are being pulled through the ringer though, and while I feel sorry for Riley, his way of coping with this is outlandish. Joyce's condition worsens as the brain tumour plotline is established, which is one of the main focuses of the season, and it's definitely interesting for the show, which is largely about mythical beasts and magic spells, to choose such a real condition for one of its recurring characters to suffer from. Talking about the snake demon for a bit, they go back and forth using CGI and practical effects to portray the demon. And while from far away the demon looks good with the CGI, when Buffy has to leap on its back, it doesn't look good at all. The practical is far better, although they couldn't close the damn thing's mouth. It looks obviously like a puppet with its mouth open all the time. I always feel a bit sorry for the snake demon because Buffy brutally kills it despite the fact that it, it never actually attempts to kill anyone or do any harm. It's just following the wills of its master. We don't think twice about it because it jeopardises Dawn's life, and we've seen it happen that many times before. What does that say about the viewer? Joyce is booked in for surgery on her brain tumour, which lightly brightens the mood around the gang. Although the pressure of the tumour on certain parts of her brain causes Joyce to suddenly speak out without realising it. So the gang decide to let her rest before her surgery. Another mental patient points at Dawn, which is actually the security guard who saw Glory feed from in No Place Like Home. The gang minus Buffy investigate the crash site of a meteor, which they believe to be an extraterrestrial from another planet. It kills the insane security guard and really decides to call in Graham and the military to assist in taking it down. The rest of the gang do some research about the alien, which they uncover as a queller demon, which has been summoned from the moon to kill the insane people that Glory has created. The gang can only theorise that Glory is cleaning up her mess as Buffy requests that she be allowed to take Joyce home for a few days before her surgery and she feels that Joyce would be more at ease at home. The doctor reluctantly agrees and the queller demon follows them home and attempts to kill Joyce, who it thinks is insane due to the tumour causing her to speak erratically. Buffy manages to kill her, running into Spike who's lurking in the basement stealing pictures before the military appear to clean the mess up. At the hospital, Ben is approached by one of Glory's minions where it's revealed that not only is there a link between Ben and Glory, but that he's the one cleaning up her mess. Just like I've done my whole damn life. Moments before going in for the surgery, Joyce confides in Buffy that she knows Dawn isn't actually her child, the tumour pressing against her brain in some way that has made the made-up memories cease for a small period of time, if you remember back and out of my mind. She's wheeled in for her surgery as the gang watch on in concern, ending the episode. So, it's established that there's a link between everything that's going on. Ben is connected to Glory, who's looking for the key. Dawn is the key, who Joyce realises isn't actually her child at the end of the episode thanks to her tumour. Thanks to her tumour, no one's ever said that before. The phrase everything's coming together would not go unused during this period by a first-time viewer. 
She calls Dawn a shadow at one point, which hints at something we shall talk about in a little while. Oh boy. Buffy stays strong for her mother and her sister and her boyfriend to a lesser extent, but can't actually compose herself when she's alone and has nothing to distract herself, like when she's washing dishes and turns on the mariachi music to drown out her mother's outbursts. She just breaks down. This is an example of an empathetic sound, where unfitting music is played over a scene which generally exuberates a drastically different emotion. Think the ear scene in Reservoir Dogs for another example. Dawn is also growing self-conscious of herself due to how many times insane people have told her she doesn't belong. She's catching on that maybe something's up, maybe not all unseen people are connected in their thoughts, and there might actually be something different about her. Riley calls in Graham to help with the Queller, which reopens a working relationship between the two which Riley had previously shut down out of my mind. Gloria doesn't appear in this episode, but Ben does, who is very much affiliated with her. We don't know much about what their relationship is yet, but all will be revealed shortly. It's a good hook to leave the viewer dangling from for the next little while. Oh, of course Marty Noxon wrote this one. I've moaned about how annoyed I can be by her underdeveloped storylines and sudden retconnings, but she has her moments of genius for the show's sake. This is not one of those moments of genius. Joyce survives her surgery, which is deemed a success, the tumour removed. In celebration, Buffy and Riley share a romantic evening together, where Buffy reveals to him that she cried a lot over her mother, none of which she did in front of Riley, which makes him feel like she doesn't want to open up to him emotionally. He gets his blood sucking fix during the night to blow off some steam, which Spike discovers. The next night, he heads to Buffy's to show her what Riley's up to. To purposefully to break them up. You gotta love a love triangle plot lines. It worked so well the first time. You gotta love a love triangle plot line. It never works, but they always insist on doing it anyway. Love triangle plot line. Please, please never again. Rayleigh is approached by Graham in the army, offering Rayleigh a new position in their anti-demon organisation. They're not interested in how demons work like the initiative wear, they just want to kill them. If he's in, they'll meet him at midnight to ship him out of there via HELICOPTER HELICOPTER while Buffy convinces the gang to burn down the abandoned vampire den, Rayleigh arrives at Spike's crypt, furious about showing his addiction to Buffy. He then stakes Spike, but not really, just with a plastic stake so it doesn't kill him as a threat? Alright, time out for a second. Why doesn't Riley just kill Spike? I know for the sake of the story, Spike has to be alive, but if I were in Riley's shoes, I'd have staked him long before this. He literally has no reason not to. It's not even like Buffy would be mad. Riley and Buffy have another argument about how Riley has no purpose in the story of the season, and Riley drops the bombshell about Graham offering him a job, and that if Buffy doesn't want him here, truly, then he'll go tonight. Buffy is pissed at this ultimatum, but Xander, of all people, helps Buffy come to the idea that Riley is the one for her, and that it's incredibly unlikely that someone as passionate or loving as that will ever come along again. He's given her everything, while well, Buffy has continued to treat him as an angel rebound ever since they got together. Oh Christ. So of course Buffy realises she's wrong and attempts to catch Riley before the helicopter takes off and as she sprints like she's never sprinted before, she doesn't catch Riley and he fucks off. Buffy is depressed, while Xander uses his experience of Buffy's to tell Anya how much he values her and loves her. What a ridiculous episode. In every way possible. The entire point of this arc is to get Riley out, since his character was such a huge flop with the viewers, but the reasons for him to leave, and the way both him and Buffy behave, is outlandish. I've said that word already, but I'll say it again. Riley wasn't liked, mostly because he was seen as Angel's replacement rather than as his own character. They started him out to be the most normal guy they could, but as viewers made their opinions clear, the writers seemed to play into that, and have him do stupid and dumb shit just to write him out. Buffy initially wanted a normal boyfriend, which is why she chose Riley. Riley wanted Buffy originally because she was different to the other girls, but all he wanted in the end was a normal girlfriend. They both actually want the same thing, but can't communicate it, so neither get what they truly wanted. There's some form of intelligence in that idea, I suppose, but here's why I think it isn't. The writers loved creating tension between characters that allows the viewer to pick a side, rather than saying either is correct. The episodes leading up to this were portraying yet another example of this. Riley could have been right because he wanted to be there for Buffy, to help her through a difficult time, though she wouldn't let him. Buffy could have been right because for Riley to pull all this me 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 crap while her mother was literally dying of cancer was incredibly immature, so they implement this conflict into the story, and then after a few episodes, definitively pick a side that's correct, citing ridiculous reasons that Buffy hasn't loved Riley simply because she doesn't want to, completely negating the respect that a writer should always have for the viewer, a dynamic that this show has used so well over its run thus far. You can maybe say that her and Riley have only been going out for a year or so, and that it might take Buffy a little longer to know if he's truly the one for her, and whether she can depend on him or not, following the disastrous relationship between her and Angel. Well, if the situation has taught us anything, it's that Buffy can't depend on Riley. It's understandable that perhaps 
once Buffy hasn't been thinking straight and acting normally due to Joyce being terminally ill, I found myself initially siding with Riley, but as Joyce's condition worsened and Riley got more and more annoyed that Buffy wouldn't cry with him, I did a complete 180 and sided with Buffy. Had the show made Riley exit without any of the Xander stuff, this would have been, in my opinion, a completely fine exit for him. It's that last bit of telling the viewer, fuck what you thought. Riley was right the whole time, that feels like such a stab in the back. In other news, Anya expresses to Xander that she doesn't think the gang fully accepts her. Oh for god's sake, we did this like five episodes ago with Tara! The show has recycled plots for singular episodes before, but never entire character arcs, let alone character arcs that happen in the exact same season as each other. This is thankfully closed out early on by Xander's profession of love at the end of the episode. Moving into positives now, it was pretty interesting to see Riley and Spike actually bond over their mutual understanding of loving Buffy, but not being loved back. This is a great dynamic, but it's only for one scene and never again. This episode comes so fleetingly close to contentment, but through one fuck up, it goes down as a horrendous conclusion to a character I actually liked during last season, and both an all around poorly written episode and disappointing mid season finale. Right, now that we've had a breather, let's ease us into the second act of the season with a mainly nothing episode surrounding the tension between Anya and Willow. Giles is leaving to head to London after inquiring if the Watchers Council have any information on Glory that could be of help to the gang's quest to see her yammering about the key. Don and Buffy share a talk about Rayleigh's departure, and Don tells Buffy to remain hopeful that Rayleigh may return one day after realising that the military life isn't for him anymore. Yeah, right. Xander and Tara are sick of Willow and Anya fighting all the time, so they tell them to sort it out amongst themselves. This ends poorly as they accidentally summon a troll named Olaf, who Anya once dated and was the first person she cursed catching the attention of the Hoffron and the Vengeance Demons. Here the episode briefly splits the gang into unfamiliar duos, which gives these characters that really don't have much time together on screen the time to bond. Buffy and Tara share a chat about the new semester as Buffy resumes her college education following her mother's recovery. She also gets overly upset when the idea of her friends' relationships could ever possibly end. Very Jane Esmondson. Xander and Spike run into each other at the bronze as Olaf comes strolling in looking for ale and babies to eat. Willow and Anya almost total Giles car catching up to Olaf where the entire gang meet up as Olaf destroys the bronze. Back at the magic box, Willow and Anya are sent back to find a spell that will get rid of Olaf, where they finally realise why they're so hostile towards each other, their love for Xander, and that it might pull him away from the other. Olaf and Xander soon get into a tussle as Olaf gives Xander the decision of picking either Anya or Willow to die. Side note, how the fuck does this 100 ton hammer, swung by a 100 ton ogre, not break every bone in Xander's body when it hits him? Like Christ! Xander refuses to choose and Olaf decides to kill Xander instead. Anya steps up to offer her sacrifice, but Buffy soon arrives and distracts Olaf long enough for Willow to find a spell that sends him to another dimension. In the closing scenes of the episode, Giles has returned and tells Buffy that the Council currently have no information on Glory, but will be back once they have researched further into her. As Buffy, Giles, and Joyce talk about the key, an eavesdropping Dawn hears her name mentioned and grows concerned that there's something they're not telling her. So why no Giles? Well, this is because Anthony Head and his family lived in England. Any chance he got, he would fly over for a few days to spend time with his kids before flying back to America to film Buffy. This exhausted the poor guy, and there are a few times where Giles is noticeably absent from either a appearing on screen or from the episode altogether. The reason I bring this up is because it will become incredibly important to an out of character storyline that has befuzzled many viewers in the next season. It gives the gang a chance to work without him and everything goes wrong. The bronze is wrecked and the next time we see it will be completely redesigned. The point of this episode is about breaking the tension between Willow and Anya due to Willow's previous obsession with Xander many seasons earlier. We learn a bit about Anya's past with the introduction of Olaf who we will see again when they decide to go more in depth in a few seasons time. Olaf's hammer is left behind when he's teleported to another dimension which is an important thing to note for later in the season. Look, not much happens here. No glory, no main story progression. It's an easier episode, like I mentioned earlier. They seem to have given the episodes where not much happens to Espenson so far this season, which is a crime because I think she's probably my favourite writer of the entire team with her excellent blend of the ridiculous and interesting. That being said, I'm about to eat my hat. The Watcher's Council has arrived, led of course by Quentin Travers, refusing to give Buffy the crucial information on Gloria until they've done a comprehensive review of both her skills as a slayer and the strengths of the rest of the gang. If she fails, the Council will shut down the magic box and deport Giles back to England. What fucking dicks. Buffy is entirely capable, as we already know, but of course, not in the ways the Council wish her to be, such as learning the Japanese names for fighting instructions. Gloria, meanwhile, makes her first appearance in four episodes, with the explanation that she's had difficulty finding someone to feed from to give her strength because she's been so distracted finding the key. She visits Buffy and unknowingly talks to the key, showing to the viewer that she's unable to sense it, even if it's standing right next to her. Gloria threatens to kill Buffy's family and friends if she doesn't hand over the key, catching on that Buffy has something to do with where it is, since they keep butting heads. Buffy takes Joyce and Dawn to stay with Spike to keep them safe, where Joyce and Spike enjoy a session of soap operas together, keeping that underrated relationship between the two alive as ever. On her way back to the magic box for the results on her review, Buffy has her first encounter with the Knights of Byzantium, a group of seemingly infinite soldiers dedicating their entire lives to stopping Gloria from using the key, hell-bent on destroying it. They consider Buffy their enemy too, since 
and she's protecting the key. Buffy sends the knights on their way since she doesn't kill humans, but they warn her that they will be back and their numbers will increase. At the magic box, Buffy threatens the council, giving them one of her iconic speeches about how important each member of the gang is to their operations in Sunnydale, that Giles should be rehired by the council in his old position as her watcher, and finally, that the information is so crucial to stopping Glory as soon as possible, since she's now threatened her family, that they'll give it to the gang without her passing the review. Quentin agrees, revealing that Glory isn't a demon at all. She's a god. Oh. So this episode reopens the working relationship between Buffy and the Council again. They're just as arrogant as they were when we last saw some of the members back during the Faith arc last season, but Quentin Travers also returns for the first time in two seasons. One thing they never explain is how the Council got their information on Glory. Okay, she's a god. That's a great twist, and it's something that the gang have never faced before, upping the stakes. But where did the council look that the gang didn't? Who are their trusted sources? I suppose it doesn't matter that much, but it's a pivotal turning point in the way that the gang looks at the season's villain. Just irks me a bit, that's all. This episode begins a tradition of Buffy entering her house and putting her keys down next to the door, which is important for the eventual reason that this becomes a recurring event in a few episodes' time. The scene where Glory is in Buffy's house is really the first time that Dawn shows herself to be, spoilers, one of the most insufferable characters that the show ever has. I know... And it's a popular trend to hate on any child characters in any teen adult orientated shows since the point of the younger character is usually to annoy the older characters. However, Dawn purposefully ignores Buffy's instructions to leave for so long because she wants to be involved in what the gang are doing and then picks this moment to argue with Buffy when Glory is literally in their fucking house. I haven't mentioned it yet since it hasn't been that important, but Dawn was originally supposed to be younger, like much younger than the age she ended up being. I think we didn't initially envision the characters maybe around 10 or 11, possibly even younger, but Sarah Michelle Geller actually put Michelle Trachtenberg's name in the pot for the role since she had worked with her previously on I believe it was the soap opera All My Children. Trachtenberg was actually 14 when she took on the role of Dawn and I think it's more obvious that she was meant to be younger in the episode Real Me, which is our first proper episode. There's a scene that I didn't talk about where Buffy is in a history lecture and she disputes the death of Rasputin, saying that it's possible he lived past his death in 1816 as there are report sightings of him for years after. This idea of someone being alive after they've supposedly died is foreshadowing to the ending of the season and the first couple of episodes of the next season. Anyway, Giles is back in the council. Buffy is learning to trust Spike by leaving her family with him when they're in danger, and the unknown force of the Knights of Byzantium is also introduced. Good episode. I like it. Even for its flaws. Stephen S. Knight worked as a writer on Buffy for seasons 5 and 6, but didn't return for season 7, probably due to developing and writing the most infamous episode and storyline of the show in season 6, but oh god, we'll get to that when we get to it. He mainly focused on Angel's final three seasons, which we know had mixed results. It's Buffy's 20th birthday, and as a celebration, Buffy decides that now is the time to let the gang in on Dawn being the key, since it's become increasingly more important to be cautious to the glory of being a god and all. However, Buffy's original fear of the gang treating Dawn differently now that they know was very much warranted, as Dawn soon catches on that there is indeed something wrong with her, developing from the doubts she received two episodes ago when overhearing the conversation at the end of Triangle. Dawn sneaks out of the house and runs into Spike who helps her break into the magic box to steal a peek at that diary Giles keeps hidden underneath the desk. Spike is the one to read it aloud to Dawn as both she and Spike learn that she's the key Gloria's searching for. Dawn understandably freaks the fuck out and cuts herself with a knife during her breakdown. They patch her up, but Dawn isn't very keen on speaking to any of them for the meantime. Buffy storms to Spike's crypt the next day and as she beats him up to make herself feel better, blaming him, Spike is quick to point out that if Buffy hadn't lied to Dawn in the first place, this situation would never have happened, since not even he knew. As Buffy leaves, Spike doesn't seem so happy that there's tension between the Summer Sisters. While all of this is going on, Glory captures one of the Knights of Byzantium and tortures him. He refuses to speak so she feeds from him, turning him insane. Dawn overhears an out-of-context conversation about herself between Buffy and Joyce, really taking a note out of Buffy's book there, and sets fire to her diaries fleeing from the house. As the gang split up to research, Buffy and Spike share a meaningful conversation about Dawn, where he reassures Buffy that they'll find her before anything can happen to her. Buffy confesses to Spike that he was right with what he said earlier about Buffy not telling Dawn to prevent this from happening showing that she's actually warming up to Spike. Dawn meanwhile takes a trip through the park, reliving fake memories wandering at the hospital where the insane people that kept telling her she was nothing are coming across the night from earlier. She runs into Ben who keeps her company for a little while and she lets it slip that she's the key. Since we know there's a link between Ben and Glory, he begins to freak out claiming that Glory is on her way and that Dawn needs to leave and get as far away as possible from him. Dawn obviously doesn't listen and Ben transforms into Glory right in front of her eyes. Glory keeps Dawn hostage to try and learn what she knows, informing us that even though Glory and Ben inhabit the same body, they don't hold any memories of what the other does. Dawn tricks 
Beatrix Glory that she knows nothing about the key, which is when Buffy shows up with the rest of the gang, and Willow and Tara perform a spell during the brawl that teleports Glory to a completely random location on Earth, biding them some time to regroup before she gets back. Buffy tells Dawn that despite the fact Dawn was only created several months earlier, she was made from the same blood as her, making them family, no matter what. Dawn accepts this, willing to move on with her life, but can't seem to recall that Ben turned into Glory earlier. This is a very story-driven episode, full of reveals and twists in the story. Dawn learns she's the key and the disastrous aftermath that follows her discovery is the main focus, although we also learn about Ben and Glory. The comforting and passionate Ben is actually the alter ego of Glory, however, a mystical hex that either Glory or Ben has developed prevents anyone remembering their transformation seconds later. Spike gets a lot of focus this episode too, as both Summer sisters seem to be warming up to him in their own way. Dawn and Spike begin to develop a brother-like relationship as Spike looks over her, making sure she doesn't get hurt or killed by the monsters of the night. Buffy and Spike still have their confrontations, but they seem to be getting on more after previous conversations and situations from both this episode and previous. Dawn's reaction to finding out that she's the key is believable, especially for a 14 year old. It was incredibly obvious that this arc wasn't going to pan out in the way that Buffy intended it to, as Dawn was always going to find out as the stakes grew, but despite the fact that it isn't a surprise, I'm still entertained by how the gang all collectively realised just how messed up this entire predicament is. It's good to see them all working together at the end though, however, having to come up with my own canon explanation for how they find Dawn is disappointing. I better check the hospital. Seriously, just chuck in a throwaway line about Spike catching her scent or something. Jeez. I'll forgive tonight since it's his first episode, but you'll soon come to realise that he enjoys putting mistakes in his episodes, be it in terms of plot holes or borderline decision making of characters. Glory is teleported away thanks to Willow, which is important for the next stretch of episodes that focus on Spike's obsession with Buffy, and, well, all of you know the other thing that happens. Buffy is still waiting for Riley to come back or send her a letter, but it's here where she begins to give up hope, building her emotional strength following the breakup. Her physical strength has improved too, as even though she still can't beat Glory in combat, she fears far better than their first encounter back in No Place Like Home, which ended with Buffy having to leap out a window to avoid getting squished like a bug. Like I said earlier, this episode now shifts focus on the spike and his love for Buffy. He's changing his clothes, his demeanour, and even convinces Harmony to roleplay as Buffy for his own sexual fantasy. Meanwhile, Drusilla is in town massacring an entire train full of people searching for Spike. She's escaped to Sunnydale from LA where we last saw her getting set on fire in the Angel episode redefinition. Spike at first has no idea that it's true and convinces Buffy, after spending some time with her family, to take out a vamp's nest that he claims are the people who did the train massacre, but it clearly isn't, and Buffy catches on from his recent behaviour that he's in love with her, which Spike then attempts to confess. Buffy tells him that since he doesn't have a soul, he's incapable of loving anything, which is a theme brought up in the corresponding Angel season between Angel and Darla. Over on that show, they concluded that Angelus was incapable of love and that Darla never made him happy. So we can draw the same conclusion here that whatever Spike is feeling isn't necessarily love. He believes he loves her, and I guess that's all that matters. But if I go into this any further, I'm going to have a stroke from how emotionally complex I get with this character. The show settles on it being love, but I don't know. The comics then retcon that idea, and Spike confesses that whatever he felt wasn't love but a messed up version of it, so make up your own mind. I'm going to say he believes he's in love but is still incapable of it, coercing it the idea by that godforsaken chip. Spike returns to his crypt and finds Drusilla, who attempts to bring Spike back to LA with her to take on Angel. Spike is hesitant but still dumps Harmony since Drew has finally come back to him. They visit the newly refurbished bonds where Drusilla hands Spike a fresh dead body to drink from, and since they're dead, he's not technically causing them harm so this chip doesn't go off. Buffy visits Spike's crypt while he's out and finds the shrine for her in the basement. Spike and Drew then kidnap Buffy but then Spike turns on Drew, tying both of them up. Spike offers to kill Drusilla to show Buffy how much he loves her, but Buffy tells him that the only chance he had with her, ever, was when she was unconscious. As Spike rants about women, Harmony reappears and distracts Spike as Drusilla breaks free, heading for Buffy. Spike saves her, and both Harmony and Drusilla leave, believing now that the Spike they used to know is officially gone forever. Buffy destroys Spike's shrine, storming home, where Spike discovers that his invitation into Buffy's house has been revoked by one of Willow's spells at Buffy's request. So for a Spike episode, it's it's pretty good. I mentioned my confusion around the whole can Spike love debacle, but it was done on purpose. David Fury was very torn on how to handle the Spike-Buffy relationship, and decided to play with the idea that Spike's love wasn't true since he doesn't have a soul. As we go further on in the show, this will be defined more, and at some point we will have a definitive answer to the question of can Spike love. He's willing to do a hell of a lot for her though. Offering to kill Drusilla is a huge turning point for his character, moved on from his days as a big bad. Spike seems to now deem himself one of the good guys, even if Buffy doesn't believe it, as she has Willow revoke his invite. Hell, even when he drinks human blood for, as far as we know, the first time since his chip was inserted, he still decides he's done being a human drinking vampire to help out Buffy. There's an element of Spike wanting to be like Angel here, but since Angel has a soul, it's hard to compare the two when it comes to loving and sanity. Harmony returns though, making a final appearance on Buffy. There's no real explanation as to where she's been for the past seven episodes, but I can theorise since they introduced Spike's secret basement here, which has never been seen before, that she spends her 
her time under the earth for most of the day. They do break up for good here, thankfully, but she does reappear on Angel multiple times during that show's run. I was never a fan of their dynamic together, and I thought that both characters seemed to cancel each other out since they're both attention grabbers for the screen, you know. Canonically, this is also Drusilla's final appearance on either show, uh, although she will return in many more flashbacks to come. Yep, Drew flees Sunnydale and is never seen again if you don't count her hefty inclusion in the comics. I've said many times that Drew wasn't always my favourite character due to how obnoxious and over the top she could be sometimes, but Juliet Landau objectively acted the character excellently and even though we'll see her again, I'm quite disappointed they didn't give her character a better send off. Seriously, she gets set on fire and then denied by the vampire she sired. What a fall from grace. Going back to Spike, it's hilarious to see him try to act like a normal person, dressing ridiculously out of character and then laughing with Joyce and Don like he's some sort of everyday guy. At the start of the episode, Don actually willingly spends time with Spike as she feels safe around him. When Buffy drags her out of there, she mentions that she has a crush on Spike and as far as I know, this is never brought up again. I guess following Spike's confession to Buffy, Dawn loses these feelings, but it's just a weird thing to bring up and never again. If they do in future seasons, I'll be sure to mention what I've said here and eat my hat, but anyway. I enjoy this episode, as it doesn't follow the traditional format of David Fury's episodes, which mostly focus on a plot singular to that episode. Since he was so passionate about how the Buffy Spike thing should be handled, it's cool to see it done in such an original way, if you don't count the only other time I've seen it done before, isn't it, sister show predating this storyline by a matter of weeks. This episode acts mainly as the calm before the storm in terms of the season's arc, but in the grand scheme of the entire show, there are a few elements introduced here that will become more involved in later seasons. The plot is largely singular to the episode, concerning a girl named April who's been wandering around Sunnydale, asking everyone she sees if they know where Warren is. Joyce prepares to go on a date with some guy named Brian that she knows from work and seems anxious about the upcoming night. Buffy gets out of her hair by going to a party on campus at UC Sunnydale. April shows up and launches a rude spike, still but her over Buffy's actions last episode, out of a window while Buffy secures Ben's number, who also just happens to be there. The gang theorise that April is a robot and that this Warren figure is her builder. Joyce has a great date with Brian, which motivates Buffy to call Ben, and the two sort out a date right after Ben is just transformed from glory. The infamous Warren, meanwhile, is panically packing and without explaining why to his girlfriend Katrina, until Buffy shows up demanding answers. Warren built April to be his girlfriend, always being there for him and taking care of his needs. When Warren actually fell in love with a real woman, instead of breaking up with April or dismantling her, he just left her in his dorm room a few states away hoping that she'd soon run out of power before she could find him. That didn't happen and she's back to find Warren, tracking him to Sunnydale. Somehow. Back at the magic box, Spike pays a visit to the rest of the gang, refusing to leave Buffy's life alone after she shut him out last episode, and Giles threatens Spike like he does best. We are not your friends. We are not your way to Buffy. There is no way to Buffy. Katrina runs into April and the robot soon has Katrina in a chokehold due to her comments about Warren. Buffy and Warren arrive and as Katrina storms off and breaks up with Warren, Buffy damages April's wiring which causes her to shut down but not before sharing a conversation with Buffy about how Warren will eventually come back to her because he loves her. Then Buffy sees a part of herself in April and how she's been dealing with Riley's departure. She realises that she doesn't need a man in her life which she expresses to Xander because she's scared of one day ending up like an April or a Spike or even a Riley and obsessing over someone who'll never love her back as much. She cancels her date with Ben because of this. In the closing scenes of the episode, Spike approaches Warren and threatens him to build him a robot too, one based entirely off of Buffy. Buffy returns home, setting her keys down on the table next to the door, discovering a set of flowers sent by Brian, thanking Joyce for a great night. Buffy playfully calls out for her mother, referring to the flowers, turning to find her on the couch, lifeless. Mom? Mom? Mommy? This moment has been set up over the past few episodes by making the door opening scene a regular occurrence, so that when the viewer watches the beginning of this scene, there's absolutely nothing out of the ordinary. We'll talk more about this discovery next episode when it's more appropriate. When I mentioned that this episode was the calm before the storm, this is what I meant. Anyway, firstly, Warren makes his first appearance here as a one-off character, compared to the recurring villain part he'll become notorious for in the future. This establishes his failed relationship with Katrina as a result of his loneliness in college causing him to build the robot, April. The role of April was written and originally offered to Britney Spears, but she turned it down because she wanted to play a human character who worked with the gang compared to a random robot that gets killed off in one episode. As a result, Spears never appeared in the series. There are comparisons to draw between April, Spike and Riley, all of them obsessed with a love that they will never truly have. Eliminating Riley for a moment, both April and Spike are incapable of love yet convinced they feel it. Spike actually requests a Buffy robot from Warren at the end of the episode, almost like he knows the only way he'll feel loved by Buffy is from something that isn't her, something that also can't properly feel and understand love. 
Although we'll just gloss over the fact that Spike doesn't know who Warren is and wasn't told about any of this to know that he built the robot. But anyway, Spike does try to move on from Buffy following Giles' threats, but he can't. I always love a good threatening Giles scene. We get one like every season and it shows how great of a villain Anthony Head can play, similar to his roles on Merlin and Ted Lasso. Gloria's returned to Sunnydale this episode, although she won't actually try anything until the final arc of episodes. It's sad they couldn't make this episode work without Ben, because it doesn't make much sense that Gloria's in Sunnydale for the rest of the season, yet just sits about doing nothing to make progress for almost all of that time. There's a moment where Ben and Buffy are talking about going out on a date and I noticed there's this trope that this show seems to use all the time, which is talking about something else when they're referring to asking each other out. Buffy and Ben talk about coffee, is it? It's like it's an inanimate object when they're actually talking about asking each other out. Scott and Buffy did this two seasons ago but used Buster Keaton as an example instead. Anyway, Xander plays a minor role in this episode but I have to say, I like this Xander. Gone are his sexist comments replaced with a far more chilled out guy with strong comedic delivery comfortable around his gang of friends. Enormous amount of research we should do before... No, I'm lying. I'm not squat. I'd just like to see Xander squirt. <laughs> funny. Charming and funny. That's the kind of subtle character development I love. Oh, anyway, enough distractions. I guess we have to get to it at some point. The second episode of The Big Three, which I mentioned in my Season 4 video, is the three episodes everyone unanimously agrees upon as some of the best episodes of the show. The Body isn't an episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, at least not in the traditional sense. All of the characters' dialogue and settings are Buffy, but the structure and topic are entirely unique to any other episode we've seen thus far. The plot is incredibly simple, but that's not why people cite this as a great episode. Buffy and her friends react and deal with the death of Buffy's mum, Joyce. We see each character react in the hours following the news of her passing, with no no background music, demons, or magic spells bar the final scene where a vampire appears. It's the most realistic portrayal of grief you will ever see in any form of media. There's something so mundane about how everything happens that makes it feel so real. Like you could just put yourself in this situation. I almost don't want to break it down scene by scene and just let it speak for itself, but to sum it up quickly, Buffy returns home like we saw at the end of the last episode and panically calls 911. As she attempts CPR while waiting for the paramedics to arrive, she calls Giles telling him to come to the house. The paramedics arrive and are unable to revive Joyce, although that doesn't stop Buffy from briefly imagining it happen. The paramedics tell Buffy to wait for the coroner to arrive and leave, which is when Giles appears, completely clueless, and attempts to resuscitate her himself. Buffy hurriedly tells him that the paramedics instruct her not to disturb the body, which is when she breaks down as the reality of the situation hits her. Buffy travels to Dawn's school and lets Dawn know about what happened. The junior high drama that was so important to Dawn just moments earlier is now out of her mind completely. At UC Sunnydale, Willow and Tara wait for Xander to arrive and pick them up to take them all to the morgue. Willow keeps obsessing over what to wear, believing none of it to be appropriate for the situation. In comfort, Tara and Willow share a passionate kiss, they are first to be shown on screen, and soon Xander and Anya arrive, with Anya constantly asking inappropriate questions about cutting open Joyce's body. Willow has a go at Anya, for these remarks, but Anya soon begins crying as she hasn't ever experienced a loss both when she was a human and a thousand year long spell as a vengeance demon. So she has no idea what to do or say and thus keeps asking about what's going to happen. Xander punches a wall in anger once an eerie silence grows over the group, waiting for Tara to come back from searching for one of Willow's shirts that she insists on wearing. Once Steve cleans Xander up, they head out to the morgue as Xander's illegally parked car gets a ticket outside. At the hospital, the doctor who worked on Joyce during her surgery tells the gang that Joyce died of an aneurysm as a result of her brain surgery, which would have been impossible to foresee or stop and that Joyce felt almost no pain as she passed. Are you sure that there wasn't a lot of pain? Absolutely. You only have to lie to make you feel better. Dawn leaves to go to the bathroom while the others grab something to eat from the vending machine as Giles goes to sign some release forms. This leaves Buffy and Tara to have an exchange about Tara's mom and how she had died a few years earlier. Dawn sneaks into the morgue to say goodbye to her mother and as she approaches the body, a vampire rises across the other side of the room. Buffy luckily realises where Dawn has gone to and stops the vampire just in time as the sheet covering Joyce's face falls off. Dawn slowly reaches out to touch her mother's face, but before she can do so, the episode ends. It's more of a work of art rather than an episode of a show about killing vampires. There's something in there about how many demons and vampires Buffy has killed yet. This is the first time that death has really hit her. Joyce dies as a result of complications following her surgery, but it's generally agreed upon that the reason for her tumour and subsequent death is Dawn's arrival. Since she would have been the person most affected by the fake memories, what with the entire pregnancy and raising to be implemented, and since she doesn't have slayer abilities or healing, this could be a logical reason for the condition to arise. Remember when 
when Joyce's tumour would press against her brain and stop the fake memories temporarily, even referring to Dawn as a shadow? The exact same thing they called her tumour in the eponymous episode, Shadow. It's the fact that Joyce dies from something that isn't magical, so Buffy can't save her or reverse the effects, which will actually be explored further in the next episode. Willow and Tara share their first on-screen kiss, which was done as, at the time, the WB were a bit here and there on whether they would actually like same-sex kissing on their network. Whedon worked around this and found a loophole that as long as the kiss wasn't sexual, but done rather as a comfort, he could get it allowed. I like that they do it here first, it makes it more impactful. Of course, it's heinous that the network were so strict with any homosexual acts being shown in their programming, but all I can say is, unfortunately, it was a different time. The only hate I've ever seen this episode get from fans of the show is either because A, they believe it to ruin the pace of the season, stopping any progression of the main plot with Glory to do this. I disagree, because the past episodes have been a break from the usual plotline purposefully to implement this episode into the season effectively without breaking the run. Or B, because Spike doesn't make an appearance. Really what's going on with that point is that some folks can't handle how real the episode is, creating fake reasons that don't hold up in order to support their claims that this episode is anything but brilliant. Joyce's funeral is organised, and Dawn has taken the whole ordeal pretty hard. She feels betrayed that Buffy talked to Joyce about funeral arrangements with her before she went in for a surgery without her being present. You know, because they didn't want to depress or stress the fuck out of a 14 year old with mortifying prospects, like your own mother's funeral. Dawn decides to stay with Willow and Tara for the night, demanding that they help her resurrect Joyce with their magics. If you're wondering where Buffy is while all of this is going on, she's with Angel, who returns briefly to give her the emotional support she needs. Luckily, this occurs after Angel's epiphany, or else we might have had an early cremation had he come round sooner. The two share a kiss but quickly realise how bad of an idea that is. Okay, I'm, I'm not really sure why any of this is in here again. But it's Marty Noxon, so I'm not entirely surprised. Sometimes fan service makes no sense for the story, Marty. Dawn is in a huff with Willow and Tara since it's a terrible idea to resurrect Joyce as it would probably go wrong, but Willow feels bad for Dawn and decides to point her in the right direction. Dawn attempts a resurrection spell on Joyce's grave, but Spike stops her moments before she completes it. Earlier in the episode, Spike left flowers for Joyce due to their friendship being the only he's ever had with any of the gang. Sandra does the whole intimidation act, believing him to be attempting to score points with Buffy. He takes He's on to see Doc, an expert on these sorts of things. Yep, Spike decides to help Don bring Joyce back, but in the proper way. Doc points him in the direction of a demon egg needed for the spell, which they obtain, and then he informs Don that the only way to reverse the spell is to destroy the picture of Joyce she's using as a template. Don performs the spell as Tara realises what Willow did, calling Buffy in a rush, but it's too late. Don completes the spell, and Joyce approaches the house, risen from the grave. Buffy begins to break down when Don accuses her of not crying since Joyce died, which isn't true, and that Joyce was the only one who loved her, which also isn't true. Buffy admits that if she stops working or keeping her mind occupied, she will realise that her mother is dead and won't be able to stop herself from breaking down. Buffy isn't ready to take on all the responsibilities of parenthood and looking after her sister and working life such as paying for the house and hospital bills. Joyce knocks on the door as Buffy hopefully bounces over to answer it. However, Dawn comes to her senses and tears the picture up, Joyce disappearing into nothingness before Buffy can see what state she's come back as. Both sisters cry in each other's arms, weaving their mother. The only other thing that happens in this episode to take note of is a conversation between Ben and one of Glory's minions. Ben now knows that Don is the key, and he accidentally lets it slip that the key is a person to the minion. Ben then attempts to kill the minion before it can tell Glory, but it survives and informs the goddess when she re-inhabits the body. Pretty depressing episode, all things considered, although not as depressing as the last. I wish the funeral scene was portrayed with as much grace as the last episode was instead of being overly cliché with shots of the characters while sad piano music plays. Anyway, Don and Buffy grow closer by the end of the episode as they've both taken their mother's death very badly, dealing with it each in their own separate ways. Don is so determined to bring Joyce back, determined determination that she probably gets from her sister, which is something that Spike points out while on their egg quest together. That brings me to Doc, a very shady yet strangely compassionate character who we don't know much about yet. He appears human at first, but that tale is anything but. We'll see more of him shortly. Willow helps Don look in the right places for a resurrection spell, even though she agrees with Tara that it's incredibly wrong and dangerous. I suppose this is the first sign of Willow abusing magic and the responsibilities that come with using it, which is one of the main plotlines of season 6, but I don't know. This isn't abuse, she feels sorry for Don and does something out of character. Willow is smart very smart. She really shouldn't be stupid enough to do something like this. It's not like Dawn's just going to read it and call it a day. She was obviously going to try this spell. But then I guess we wouldn't have an episode then if she didn't, so there you go. The other members of the gang react to Joyce's funeral afterwards, with Xander and Anya sharing a meaningful conversation about living life to the fullest, and Giles sits in thought listening to the same cream record he listened to with Joyce back in Band Candy. Wait a minute, this is what it's been. Also, Glory is on Buffy's trail, with the newfound knowledge of the key being a human thanks to dipshit Ben. A bit of a mix. There are parts of this episode I like, such as Spike and Don's relationship, the final scene with Buffy and Don, uh, the way they don't show Joyce at all but rather just her walking feet in anticipation for a reveal that never happens. But the negatives, inconsistencies and step backs are becoming all too common with Marty Noxon's writing. 
Buffy feels that being the Slayer is stealing the humanity from her due to the strong emotional barrier she had all throughout organising Joyce's funeral. This leads Giles to do what he promised in the first episode and help Buffy find what her purpose is as a Slayer. They drive into the middle of nowhere where Giles performs a ritual to temporarily pass guardianship of Buffy to another guide. Meanwhile, Glory sends her minions to keep an eye on Buffy's friends to find out who she protects the strongest, believing that to lead them to the key. Spike receives back his Buffy bot from Warren who flees town shortly after. Spike spends a lot of the night having sex with the Buffy bot due to the built-in programs and fantasy it portrays. As a precaution in case any of the gang come across it, he had Warren program in all the Slayer stuff to not raise suspicions. Of course, the bot leaves during the night and then runs into Xander and Anya, covering Buffy's patrol of the cemetery. Spike catches up and cancels his suspicions of Xander and Anya, fighting off some vamps, until they catch Spike and the bot having sex moments later. Xander goes back the next day to confront Spike about taking advantage of Buffy during a tough time. Glory's minions arrive, having spied on the Buffy bot the previous night, now believing Spike to be the key. They kidnap him as Buffy is spoken to by her guide in the form of the first Slayer, which tells Buffy that her gift, as a Slayer, is death. Buffy is ultimately confused at this information, and returns home as the gang begin to panic that Spike may give away that Dawn is the key to glory. The Buffy bot is with them, and the gang are oblivious, just thinking Buffy's acting weird because of her grief. The real Buffy immediately realises that it's a robot, and they all travel to Glory's apartment to get Spike out of there before he spills the beans. It's understandable. Spike is strong and mysterious and sort of compact but well-muscled. I am not having sex with Spike. But I'm starting to think that you might be. Spike, after being tortured by Glory, refuses to give Dawn up, and then manages to escape down to the lobby before the gang and Buffy Bot show up. They save Spike, returning him to his crypt. With the magic box, Willow concludes that if it were ever needed, she could repair any damages to the Buffy Bot. Buffy then goes to Spike, pretending to be the bot to find out why he didn't give Dawn up, telling her that if anything happened to Dawn, it would tear the real Buffy to pieces and he couldn't live with himself if he did that. Buffy reveals herself to be the real Buffy, gently kissing Spike as a thank you, through her disgust that he had a robot made of her, and then leaves the shock Spike. The Buffy bot is introduced here, which will be an important plot point over the next little while. Spike reveals himself to have two polar opposite sides. One is a creepy stalker who likes to have sex with robots, and the other is a caring figure who's willing to die for Buffy's happiness. Buffy seems to be conflicted too, because for the life of me, I can't understand why she pretends to be the robot at the end, and why she kisses Spike when he's been having sex with a robot replicate of her that he had made. She seems to have a soft spot for him, and if that's the case, it might explain why he wasn't staked last season. Buffy travels with Giles to a desert remarkably like the one Buffy dreamed about while talking to the First Slayer in Restless, where she also talks to a guide form of the First Slayer, telling Buffy that the love she believes she is incapable of will lead her to her gift, which is death. We don't know exactly what that means, obviously, but we will soon. With Jane Espenson writing, there's always going to be laughs, and most of them come from the gang believing that the Buffy bot is the real Buffy. Now, one thing I noted during this episode is Tara's role in the gang, which reminds me a lot of Lorne in Angel. She never fights or kills anything, choosing to sit at the sidelines and provide support in other ways, such as research, pats on the back, or in Lorne's case, singing. <laughs> Dawn begins her kleptomaniac arc here, stealing Anya's earrings. This is just a setup for next season, rather than an arc that will be exclusive to this season. The episode's okay, not much else to say. We'll learn a bit about Spikes and her conflict and fantasies about Buffy, and that Buffy's purpose is death. Similar to Angel's final four episodes working like a two and a half hour movie, Buffy does the same here. While all work individually, each episode written by a different writer, they are structured and best consumed as one piece of media. Buffy drops out of college due to having to look after Dawn. She has no time to study and go to classes, she has to find work soon. Dawn meanwhile is failing at school, skipping classes and getting suspended, putting even more pressure onto Buffy to look after her well. She asks Giles for advice and help in looking after Dawn, but he declines, citing that she needs to be more authoritative with her if she wants to get through. Ben gets fired from the hospital since Gloria has been taking control for longer periods of time, meaning that he hasn't been able to show up for work in weeks. Glory's minions have come up with a new suspect for who the key is, the person who has been with them the shortest and who hardly fights or kills anything. Tara. Her and Willow have an argument when Tara expresses her fear of how powerful Willow is becoming as a witch, and Willow then accuses Tara of believing her lesbian status is temporary. How the fuck did she jump to that? Anyway, Tara goes to a local fair alone to spend some time thinking, where Glory finds her, soon realising that she isn't the key and sucks her brain out instead. Willow decides to put the fight behind her and Tara, and then goes to the fair, witnessing Tara's brain suckage first hand. At the hospital, Willow plans to get revenge on Glory for what she did to Tara, with Buffy attempting to talk her out of it. She doesn't, and Willow goes full black-eyed witch on Glory. Spike and Dawn talk, where Dawn expresses her guilt about what happened with Tara since it was all to find the key. Spike comforts her as Buffy tells them about Willow's revenge plan. Spike tells Buffy that she's stupid if she thinks Willow wasn't going to go after Glory. Buffy then goes after Willow and manages to escape with her before Willow is killed by the goddess. The next day as Willow and Tara welcome Buffy and Dawn over for lunch, Glory breaks her way in to find them, where the mindfuck Tara reveals that Dawn is the key right in front of Glory. So the main focus of this episode is Buffy and Dawn, as Dawn shows herself to be quite a rebellious and difficult child. It's not until Buffy tells her that if she can't show herself to be a good caterer that 
that Don will get taken away from her to live with a more competent family. Buffy initially leans on Giles for help, but he doesn't want to have Buffy depend on him as much as she does. He's her watcher, but he's also homesick. I think Giles still wants to go home one day and live in England, but to do that he needs to transition Buffy into working more independently. He completed the task he promised Buffy, which was to find her purpose as a slayer in the last episode. Once Glory is dealt with, there's nothing stopping the guy from flying. Once he believes Buffy is capable on her own, Tara shows her true feelings about Willow's power. She's scared because Willow has shown herself to be easily swayed by her emotions, as shown last episode also when she helped Dawn resurrect her mother. Magic is dangerous because it can very easily lead you down a dark path. There is dark magic and light magic, but the darker the magic, the harder it can be to climb out of the hole it puts you in. Tara's fear turns out to be well warranted when Willow goes to get revenge on Glory. We see what magic can do to Willow when she's angry, and if this were anything but a god that she was up against, it would be dead. Glory isn't dead though, and she soon discovers who the key really is. The third time truly is the charm. Buffy and Don get the fuck out of there as Gloria chases them soon getting hit by a truck which turns her back into Ben. Meaning up as Anders plays, Buffy does something she has never done before when facing a big bad. Flee. Buffy and the gang can't come up with a plan. Nothing that can take Gloria out for good. So they just take off and hope they can escape long enough for them to come up with something to stop her. Spike covers the transport and the RV gets moving. Meanwhile, the Knights of Byzantium retrieve their insane compadre from the hospital who reveals that the key is a little girl. Because he saw it, if you remember. The Knights catch up with the RV and attack. Buffy manages to fend them off but Giles gets impaled during the madness while taken over driving. The RV flips and the gang escape to an abandoned gas station where Willow sets up a temporary force field to bide some time while they figure out a way to escape. Spike and Xander discuss the possibility of running as their only option, and that even if some of them escape, that's better than none. Buffy overhears this against any idea that enters anyone dying. She does reveal that she managed to capture the General as a hostage who spills the beans on what the key is, why Glory wants it, and all this juicy information we've been waiting for. Glory ruled over a hell dimension, but it was banished by the other gods because they feared how powerful and heartless she became. They trapped her a human host, Ben, where she was meant to lay dormant, but that never happened due to her power. Buffy is obviously oblivious that Ben is the host because of the magic spell, as are the knights. Dawn is the key, which is the only way that Glory can return to her home dimension. However, the key unlocks the doors to every hell dimension, so an unlimited amount of hell creatures will begin taking over Earth. The monks wanted to use the power of the key for good, which I don't really understand how that works. The key only has one purpose. They discuss the key being a big ball of energy, but what the hell do monks need energy for? Giles is near death's door, so Buffy calls the only person she can think of that is a doctor. Ben! Oh shit! Ben does save Giles and has a confrontation with the general who attempts to convince Ben to kill Dawn to save the world. Glory soon takes over Ben's body, of course, and she kills the general, grabs Dawn, and gets the fuck out of there, bursting through Willow's force field. She decimates the Knights of Byzantium in their entirety, using Ben's car to escape. Buffy, instead of being determined to get Dawn back, completely shuts down and collapses on the floor. So here comes the hopelessness, which every good story needs for the eventual happy resolution. Buffy doesn't have a plan, just to keep running until they do, which drives them into a corner. Buffy still has a lot to learn, contrary to what Giles may think, and this is something the show will tackle again in a much more terrible way in season 7. In fact, this whole episode and arc feels like a dress rehearsal for the finale we would eventually get. Everyone crammed into one vehicle, dissension in the ranks, Buffy coming up with a shit plan resulting in the rest of the gang working without her for a short time. It's just sped up. I'll mention it here since I haven't before, but after this season of Buffy, the WB had no interest in running the show anymore. Not because they didn't like it. Hell, it was one of the most profitable and popular shows, but they just didn't have the money to. The licensing fees, you know, what with all the rising stars and the special effects, the whole thing was becoming too expensive for this small network. The original contract for the show was for five seasons, so after that, it was unknown if Buffy would find a home on another network or not. So, season five was written with the idea in mind that Buffy would end and never come back. The elements that we'd wanted for the finale were implemented here, but on a much lesser scale. The show would get picked up by UPN and run for another two years, thankfully, but keep that in mind when watching this. This entire arc is designed to be Buffy's last hurrah in case of cancellation. Giles, much like Wesley and Angel, begins a seasonal trend of coming so ridiculously close to death, yet somehow managing to survive. I have no idea if it was intentional that this happened, or so commonly, but it's funny that they keep this trope for the same character on a seasonal itinerary. The insane people the Glory has created all seem to be linked in their thoughts as they all begin muttering when the key being captured becomes an inevitability. Anyway, the Knights of Byzantium are dead, and Dawn is surely as good as dead too, with Buffy out of action. What will the rest of the gang do? Yeah, so with both Buffy and Giles out of commission, Willow takes charge, creating a plan where the gang return to Sunnydale, and while Spike hunts for Glory and Xander takes Giles to the hospital, she'll try and get through to Buffy. Here we find out that while everyone else has forgotten Ben's transforming into Glory, Spike remembers. The loophole in the spell only works on humans, and since Spike is a vampire, he has to deal with the constant hell of telling them that Ben is Glory before the spell causes the gang to completely forget seconds later. Snatch the kid and vanished, remember? If you do remember... 
Is everyone here very stoned? They travel back to Xander's place and Willow enters Buffy's mind, conversing with her at certain impactful memories of Dawn in her life, and also made up memories. Firstly, her first memory of Dawn, being brought home for the first time. And oh shit! Look who it is! Hank Summers, you raw dogger, where's that secretary you'll leave your wife for in a few years? There's other stuff here, well, like Buffy placing a book on a shelf, as well as being told death is her gift. But the sequence of memories and fantasies, like smothering Dawn, which definitely never happened, keep looping, and Willow struggles to get through to Buffy. Meanwhile, Glory prepares Dawn for the ritual, but ends up succumbing to Ben as her grip on the spell loosens. And People start to remember their transformation. We need information. We need Ben's glory. Who's what? Oh, that's right. Xander and Spike go to see Doc for information on Glory, but he proclaims to not know much. He's lying, and when Spike calls him out on it, he attacks them. Yes, Doc is actually a worshipper of the goddess and throws this mysterious box into his fireplace before Xander stabs him to death. They leave, but Doc isn't actually dead. Ben tries to take Dawn as far away as possible before he changes back, but ends up having an argument with Glory and a great scene where the two have a back and forth in the same body. Glory manages to convince Ben to take Dawn back and return for his immortality, preserving him as quite possibly the only living human. Willow interrupts Buffy's loot by asking about what the significance of placing the book on the shelf is. Buffy explains that this was the moment where she realised that killing Glory was literally impossible and she couldn't see a reality where she could kill her and save Dawn for good. Because of this, Buffy feels guilty and blames herself for letting Dawn get captured. Willow pulls her out of this personal hell by explaining that literally nothing is certain. Dawn is not yet dead and they can still save her. This works and as they regroup at the magic box with all the information about the ritual from that nice box and then Ben and Glory are then the same person, a now fully healed Giles can only come up with one way to stop the ritual from happening. The only way is to kill Dawn. This episode slows the pace down a significant amount, spending a lot of it in Buffy's mind where she locks herself away in her made-up memories and epiphanies. Buffy misinterprets what the guide told her in intervention, taking her death gift to mean Dawn's death, and that Buffy will kill her, or surely has, by letting Glory take her. Glory, meanwhile, is beginning to feel human emotions due to the veil between her and Ben thinning. She actively empathises with Dawn when she's captured, which Dawn is completely confused about. Ben tries to do what he believes in and doesn't want to kill Dawn, but when given the ultimatum of either himself or Dawn, he chooses himself. See, the veil might not just mean that Glory begins to feel human emotions, but maybe also that Ben begins to feel Glory's ruthless goddess emotions too. I theorise here of course, maybe he's just a human being and realises that he's trapped in a conundrum of which he must pick himself over everyone else to live. Willow shows herself to be a great leader and the natural successor to Buffy should anything happen to her. She's come a long way from that timid and unpopular teen we saw in the first two seasons, and still cares for her brain sucked girlfriend and the gang of heroes. Doc's a pretty cool character, returning from forever, even asking Spike about how Dawn's spell went from that episode. No surprise that he's evil, but the conception of his character is unlike anything we've seen in the show before. A lizard demon that looks like a human. I don't know if he's half human, half demon, like Doyle from Angel or what, but I wish he'd stuck around and maybe snuck in as a big bad in a later season. So, left with seemingly one option of killing Don before glory, what will Buffy do? Originally written with the possible intention of being the final episode of the show, The Gift is also the hundredth episode of the show. It's Buffy at its absolute purest and at its best. We open with a standard vampire dusting akin to the first season where Buffy saves a random guy in an alley to which she remarks, You're just a girl. That's what I keep saying. Returning to the magic box, Buffy refuses to even consider killing Dawn, which upsets Giles. We are not talking about this. Yes, we bloody well are! At a loss, Xander comes up with the idea of killing Ben, since he's a human and not a god. Surely he can be killed and that since Glory inhabits that body, she would die too. Giles doubts that Ben will resurface as close to the ritual, but Willow theories since this night is Glory's only chance to perform the ritual, they can just keep Dawn away from her long enough for it to be over. I haven't brought it up yet because the show never really did, but the key can only be used at one point in time, which is why Glory and the Knights had been putting the pressure on Buffy recently, because that night was approaching rapidly and it's finally here. They used their collection of items they've collected over the season, including the Dagon's that the monk used to repel Glory, and Olaf's hammer to smack the Evelyn and Shirley Glory with. Before they head out, Buffy and Giles share a conversation about all the times they've saved the world and all that she sacrificed. Giles apologises for suggesting killing Dawn, seeing it as his job to say and do the things that the other gang members can't. Buffy accepts, but tells Giles that if Dawn dies, even if they save the world, she will retire as the Slayer. Xander proposes to Anya in the basement while looking for the sphere, which Anya is initially angry about as she believes they're about to die, so he won't have to go through with it. Xander reassures her that they won't die and that he's proposing because he knows they'll live through it and spend the 
rest of their lives together. Anya tells him to propose again after they've saved the world and she'll only accept once that's happened. Willow figures out a way to reverse the brain sucking spell that Glory did to Tara, which would in turn weaken Glory significantly. Buffy invites Spike to get some weapons at her house, where Spike confesses to Buffy that he knows she'll never love him, but that she treats him like a man, which he appreciates. At sundown, the gang follow Tara to the location of Glory's ritual, where a massive tower has been built by not just Glory's minions, but all the crazy people she's brain sucked. Willow reverses the spell on Tara, weakening her as planned. Buffy takes Glory on with the Dagon's Fury around, messing with the goddess, before Glory plunges Buffy's head clean off, revealing it to actually be the Buffy bot. The real Buffy appears with a laugh's hammer, and as I said, smacks the shit out of her with. The rest of the gang are taken on Glory's demon minions, meanwhile, and Buffy pushes through them all to reach a screaming dawn at the top of the tower. Buffy doesn't make it though, as Glory catches up and they crash to the ground. Xander slows Glory down by using his construction experience to operate a wrecking ball to hit her. Buffy resumes her hammer hitting as everything seems to be going well. Oh shit, it's Doc and he wants the ritual to go ahead, so he gets ready to cut into Dawn. Spike notices someone up there with Dawn, and Willow telepathically communicates with him, while she shields Tara, buying Spike a pathway to the top of the tower. Doc is confused why Spike would help humans in any way, since he's a vampire. Why do you even care? I made a promise to a lady. Doc fucking stabs Spike and pushes him off of the tower, beginning the ritual. Glory transforms back into Ben, who Buffy can't bring herself to kill since he's innocent, and she makes him promise to leave Sunnydale and never come back, or she won't hesitate to kill him. Ben accepts, that is, until Giles appears and smothers Ben to death, unbeknownst to Buffy and the rest of the gang. She's a hero, you see. She's not like us. Us. <laughs> Buffy reaches the top of the tower too late as Doc has already begun the ritual. She shoves Doc off the roof, who dies, and watches as the walls of reality begin to collapse with creatures starting to cling through from other dimensions. Dawn offers to sacrifice herself to end the ritual since it's her blood which began it. Only her blood can stop it. As the sun rises and the pale night begins to disappear, a warm glowing epiphany hits Buffy that since the monks made Dawn from the same blood as her, her sacrifice would also stop the ritual. Whispering to Dawn to tell the gang that she'll be okay and that this is something she has to do, Buffy leaps off of the tower and into the portal, sacrificing herself to save the world. As her limp body lies at the bottom of the tower, the gang watches on in grief. We end on a shot of Buffy's grave, as Buffy's emotional speech to Dawn plays in the background. Dawn, the hardest thing in this world is to live in it. Be brave. Now, I'm not sure if this was always the original idea to end the show. I obviously don't know how much Whedon initially had envisioned of the story before the worries of the show's future changed ideas. A lot of people think it's pretty obvious though that Dawn was supposed to be the one to sacrifice herself at the end of the episode, and if you can't understand why, then you clearly haven't watched the next two seasons where Dawn's character serves literally zero purpose and becomes very one note. But I think Buffy was always meant to die here. Back in the season 3 finale, in one of Buffy's dreams, Faith says the line, Little Miss Muffet counting down from seven now between this episode and the season 5 finale, there are canonically 730 days between them, and in the season 4 finale when, again in Buffy's prophetic dream, Tara looks at the clock reading 730 and claims it's all wrong, for a year had passed. Holy shit, there's no way they didn't have this all planned out. This was what the guide meant when she told Buffy that death was her gift. Her death would give the world life. Not in the same way as the comics when Buffy and Angel literally fuck a world into existence because of Whistler's meddling, no I'm not making that shit up, google that, but the Buffy died so the world didn't. You get the idea. And no, the writers didn't fuck up the Slayer activation rule established in Season 1. So many people are confused why Buffy's death here doesn't activate another Slayer, but since Buffy has died before, the Slayer line no longer runs through her, instead through Faith. Almost everything from the season comes back for this finale, bringing it all full circle and a sweeping conclusion. It pays homage to its early roots with the vampire dusting at the beginning of the episode, proving to be Buffy's last vampire she kills, in this lifetime anyway. Buffy, both the character and the show, have grown so much since its inception, which is something I mentioned literally in the first line of my Buffy Season 1 video. I mentioned Willow's character having a nice wrap up in the last episode, and reuniting her with Tara here was sweet and just. Willow will now head to Los Angeles to tell Angel about Buffy's death. I compared this final string of episodes to Angel's Pylea arc, which, in my opinion, although not as well written and thought out as Buffy's string of episodes. I mean, Buffy's is far superior in terms of both symbolism and storytelling, but I find myself enjoying the Pylea arc more, due to the pacing and chemistry of the characters just edging out Buffy's. Tyra is back to her normal self, although we don't get to see much of her afterwards due to the episode ending, but she'll be back next season. Xander ends up coming up with a permanent solution to killing Glory, and also contributes to the fight with the skills he's learned from his construction job. He's happily in love and wants to marry Anya now that the world is saved, although they should probably wait for Buffy's death to be old news before overshadowing it, which is actually one of the first plotlines he gets during the next season. 
Anya has finally found her passion as a human, both job-wise and husband-wise. She no longer kills humans as a vengeance demon, but instead kills demons as a human being, a complete character reversal. Jill's act of killing Ben at the end of the episode is unique in that, despite stating that he no longer wishes to shield Buffy from the world, like with Luke and after Dawn and being the Slayer, since he wishes one day to return to England, he kills Ben. This is something that Buffy can't do and shouldn't have to. It's not part of her job as a Slayer to kill humans. So, like a parent, Giles still protects Buffy from certain realities. It's cleverly hinted at earlier in the episode by Tara. You're a killer. Buffy, however, never finds out about this. She originally was supposed to find out in a later episode, but the scene was cut moments before said episode was meant to air. Like, no matter what, Jill still looks out for Buffy. I think a pretty cool idea, though, would have been for Dawn to kill Ben. An interesting test of what she considers humanity, since she has her whole down just a big ball energy art from a few episodes ago, which is still lingering around in my head, but oh well. Dawn gets her wish of being a part of the gang over the course of the season, and will most likely feel guilt for her sister's sacrifice since she's the key and all. Now that Gloria's dead, Dawn really doesn't serve a purpose as being the key anymore, so she's just a normal person and now and will function as one in the show, much to my disdain. That being said, I don't actually find myself disliking Dawn's character much in this season though, and as I remember, it's the latter two seasons where her character takes on a brand new level of headache. Buffy hints at her mental decline while chatting with Giles, the arc of which begins here and will continue into next season. The entire final battle scene at the tower is fantastic. Every character is at the peak of their strength. Spike is in the gang though, officially I can say that. It's not until now that the rest of the gang fully accept him, which they will now do over the rest of the show, until everyone's favourite Stephen S. Tonight episode, which I mentioned earlier. Spike's now almost like a man, which Buffy treats him like throughout this final arc of episodes. She can rely on him, which she finds is all he needs to bring himself happiness, her acceptance and trust. All the character stories are excellently brought to a satisfying conclusion, and although it does initially leave you wanting more, if this was the actual finale to the show, I think it would go down as one of television's best. Sure, Buffy dies and everything is wrapped up rather quickly after that, but every single character and plot line is effectively wrapped up and in a way that it can be unwrapped again in case of the show finding a new network. I love this episode. Everybody loves this episode. Everything you want everyone to be is realised. Season 5 of Buffy the Vampire Slayer is by far the most clever of the show. No episode is filler and all serve a purpose for either a character, a plot device or setting. Sure, it has a hiccup in the middle, but it quickly picks back up to deliver one of the greatest strings of episodes the show has ever had between Triangle and The Gift. Not since season 3 have I been able to say that with any confidence. The show got back on track, like I said it would in my season 4 video. They recognised things that weren't working, like Buffy and Riley's relationship, as well as Spike, in general. They fix all of this, having one hell of a speed bump in order to do so, but they recover, and they recover well. I've always cited this as the best season of the show, not necessarily my favourite. I think it's safe to say at this point that season 3 holds that mantle. However, season 5 is so unique in its overarching storytelling and traditional episodes, which make it an experience unlike any other season of Buffy. Only maybe season 5 of Angel comes close to this kind of storytelling, which did probably benefit from having Whedon's entire focus since Buffy had finished and Firefly got cancelled the year before. All I have left to say is that the writers saw what was wrong with season 4 and making up plot lines as you go along and solved that issue by planning out a coherent storyline that fans and viewers can get behind and follow confidently, Into the Woods Excluded. In fact, let's just cover that now since there's no secret there, my least favourite episode has to be Into the Woods. I spoke at length about it already, but it really shows a Nox and tendency of fucking up storylines by making only one decision. My favourite episode of the season is probably Fool for Love, but don't get me wrong, the body comes pretty close. The body is an everyday viewing, it doesn't cheer me up, but I recognise it as the work of art it is. Fool for Love is a well-paced dive into a previously unexplored backstory of one of my favourite characters, connecting seamlessly with a sister show to tell one big story. I'd also list The Replacement and The Gift as runners-up for this title. So what's next for the show? Is there anything left to see here after a conclusion? Well, evidently so, as Buffy was picked up by rival network UPN, who had a very different approach to controlling what was shown on the show compared to the WB. I'll explain what exactly I mean later, but prepare for Buffy to go dark. And I mean psychologically darker than it's ever gone before.